Hello. On behalf of the Churches of Christ, and Christ's Way Bible Institute, we welcome you to the rebroadcast of our Monday morning class. It is our desire to assist all who are interested in various Bible, and New Testament doctrines and teachings. We set as a goal one online class each Monday morning. Information and links to the live meeting can be found on our website. www. The Churches of Christ. Life. On the live meetings page. May God bless your studies in His Word. Okay. I think we're going to make it. All right. So we, in our lesson today, the title is God Provides Deliverers, and He's speaking about the children of Israel. Now, it is good to know that God does and has provided deliverers for Israel as well as for the people of God, those who are capable of leading and directing the people of God back uh, into the service of God. We look at the book of Judges. Many times when people think of Judges, they think about a person in a black robe sitting uh, behind a, a desk in a courtroom and the concept of judges here is really more about a deliverer or one who can make a distinction between the sins of the people as well as the uh, works that God wants us to do that can differentiate in the law of God to know whether the actions of people are uh, what today we would think of as being scriptural or faithful or whether they're unfaithful, and how it is that through repentance uh, we can get back to God. We have one chart here in our lesson that talks about from conquest to crisis, and that's one way of looking at the book of Judges, is to think about the fact that under Joshua, when we look to the left side of the chart, under Joshua's leadership, the children of Israel went in, began to possess their lands. But sadly, the time would come that Joshua would pass away. He would go to his eternal reward, and all the generation that had known about Joshua and the events that happened, and sadly, like happens many times, Without a strong leader, uh, people begin to move away from God. I know in our country uh, and within the church, there have been many times that the church ebbs and flows. It goes in one direction and then into another. Uh, we see that today. There's periods when we have very strong preachers who emphasize the Word of God and hold the people accountable to God. And then there are those leaders that show up who through disguised philosophies, such as the grace of God, lead people into all kinds of sin uh, under the banner of liberating them from what many today call the Pharisees. And so they lead the people into sin. Now this particular chart uh, breaks it down into some of the cycles that we're going to discuss. And this is during the time that uh, the children of Israel should have finished the conquest of the land. Sadly, in the end of the first chapter, we find that the children of Israel were not as successful after the death of Joshua in conquering the land. It seems that they had come to rely on someone else rather than themselves as far as a way to guide them. Uh, they did not take advantage of the Levites and their understanding of the word. In a way, they had kind of had a king uh, or kings, even though we don't speak of them that way. They viewed them like that. For the generation coming out of Egypt, of course, to them Moses was like a king. 
He gave them the law. He gave them decrees. He held them accountable to God. And they began to rely on his leadership and his direction. And so instead of, again, having a relationship with God themselves and following the leadings of the Levites and the interpretation of the law, we see that that generation perished in the wilderness through various cycles of sin. Uh, then under uh, Joshua, they came in to the promised land, and Joshua was, for that generation, like uh, Moses had been in the preceding, and they looked to him for leadership like a king. But there was no leadership uh, in one person, uh, such as Moses and uh, Joshua, as the children of Israel uh, settled into the land. They were to honor God, keep his commandments, follow the direction of the Levites in the worship of God. But without that strong leadership, someone who would, as we would say today, hold their feet to the fire and make them be accountable to God, people went through these various cycles and God sent judges, military leaders in essence, who would follow the direction of God and lead the people back out of the various problems that they had gotten themselves into and the judgment that God placed upon them uh, through the nations that are around them. So the book of Judges also shows us how God will raise up a nation to punish us when we go astray. Uh, just as God punished the children of Canaan for their sins, as we discussed in the last chapter, their lack of repentance and took the land away from them and gave it to Israel. So Israel, as it enters the land, does not uh, faithfully follow the things of God as they should. And so it leads them uh, into various problems. And we can go across here and look at some of the aspects. You can do this. Uh, this is, as we're going to see here, the first cycle, second cycle, and it speaks of apostasy and oppression. And we'll look at that. Uh, and I think this chart that we have here uh, shows us uh, what we're talking about. If you look at number one, the people fall into sin and idolatry. The children of Israel were warned by Moses and by Joshua. Joshua, in the end of the book of uh, Joshua, tells the people, choose this day whom you will serve. And he told them, you know, I'm not sure that you can serve God. And they said, oh, yes, we will, we will serve God. And so he told them to choose. They said they would choose God. But as Joshua had warned them, they fell into sin, as many do. The old man of sin is supposed to be crucified, especially with us in Christ. When we enter into a relationship with God, it is a new relationship and we should be faithful to him. But we see that people sin. They went against the law of Moses. Today they go against the law of Christ. They served idols that they either brought with them out of Egypt or idols that they acquired in the land of Israel. Uh, and in the land of Israel, archaeologists have found literally thousands on top of thousands of private personal idols as well as formal worship idols. Many homes had an idol that wasn't much more than maybe six inches tall, but that was their idol, and they bowed to it, and they worshiped, and they served it. Uh, and the Israelites found those idols, and instead of destroying them, uh, they chose to worship them rather than God. Seems to be an interesting characteristic of man. 
that, you know, we will worship just about anything and follow just about anything but God. It is God that has our best interests uh, in, at heart. He created us. He knows what's best for us, but we just can't keep from allowing sinful flesh to lead us into idolatry. And the worship of idols, as I have said and will say and continue to say, is nothing more. It's, it's not just the little figurine or the huge statue that uh, really is, is idolatry. What at the very heart is idolatry? Well, you know, idolatry is trying to make God in our image or at least in the image that we want. Today, people want to do what they want to do, and they will create a new church. Uh, if they don't like what uh, the preacher is preaching, if they don't like the truth, they'll go up the road or down the street, and they'll get them another building, and they will uh, create a new Christianity for them because they do not wish to follow the Word of God. And so this first part uh, is very important as far as having sin in our lives and not keeping it away and then going away to serve ourself in some adulterous way, even if we call it Christianity and even uh, if we uh, worship and sing songs to Jesus and God, we're still living in sin. And the children of Israel tried to do that. They tried to live in sin and worship a God that was not known. And the response to that, of course, is natural. God is angry. You know, I'd be angry too. Mm -hmm. As parents, we become very upset when our children are disrespectful to us, when our children get into all kinds of trouble with all And so God is angry with the children of Israel because of the things they are involved in, the uh, digression and leaving of the law that Moses gave them. And so as the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter tells us, you know, God deals with the Israelites and he deals with us. When we sin, he will chastise us. He will use something to punish us, just as a parent will punish a child for doing wrong. And so God brings, in number three, oppression in the book of Judges to his people. Now, just like a parent, uh, it breaks a parent's heart to have to punish a child. It breaks their heart that they are not obedient as they should. But a true parent understands that you can't allow children to continue to do what they want when it's wrong. And so the way God punishes the children of Israel after giving them an opportunity to repent is he brings oppression from their enemies. In the book of Judges, if you take the book of Judges and you look at the various people that God uses, if you look at all the nations that were around the land of Israel at that time, over the course of the book of Judges, almost every nation from around the people of Israel at one time or other were used to punish Israel for its sin. And so God sends a enemy, another country, to punish them. It's amazing when we look at number four, it's only when things get so difficult that we feel we just can't take anymore that as in the book of uh, Judges, the people cry out to God, God save us. God, why would you let this happen to us? And they begin to question God and his love and they began to plead for him. 
And eventually they come to realize that it is their sins that have got them where they are. And so they repent and they pray God. And number five, God brings to them salvation, deliverance through uh, a chosen judge. And that's what we're looking at here in the book of Judges. And they will have a period of peace, at least until that judge dies. And once that judge who has led them back into the way of God passes away, the people fall back into sin and adultery when someone is not there to practically force them to do the right thing. And interesting, going back to number five, is the word salvation. In the Old Testament, the word salvation is primarily used not for uh, being delivered from sin, but being delivered from oppression and enemies. And so in the Old Testament, salvation has a very physical aspect of being delivered from oppression and enemies. While in the New Testament, primarily the word salvation is used to deliver us literally from sin. And so there is repentance, there is salvation, there is deliverance, peace is made again with God. And again, the judge dies, the people fall into sin and adultery, God is angry, he oppresses them, the people cry out. They are given a judge who delivers them a period of peace. The judge dies. And so this cycle continues throughout the book of Judges. And I would also say that this cycle continues not only in the book of Judges, but if you carefully read and study 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, the study of the history of the children of Israel you'll see that that doesn't stop just with the book of Judges. It continues on. This is an ongoing cycle that is not limited to the Judges. It's something that by now we should have learned. Uh, a famous saying is, if we do not learn from history, we condemn ourselves to repeat it. Those who will not listen, who will not study, who will not learn from the past, will in most, ta most cases and times fall into the same error, uh, into the same type of sin. And so uh, I think it would be good, uh, many of you probably already have, but uh, as preachers and Bible teachers, uh, it's, it's good to think about this and share it with our congregations and with our friends. Uh, you know, most people sadly uh, live in this area here. They live in sin and worship of self and what they want. And we need to get them all the way over here to peace and obedience with God. And so this makes a, a good chart uh, to use of asking people, where do you think you are right now in your life and in your relationship with God. Uh, this chart, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. If you want to look at it, you can. Uh, it kind of covers the timeline and uh, units, uh, way people have broken it down into sections uh, to, to be able to study. Now, this timeline says that it follows. 1350 BC to 1014 BC, which is a total of 336 years that are covered in the book of Judges. Now, our workbook is a little bit different. There's about a hundred years difference in this chart and the timeline that we have in our study guide. The study guide says that we're about 1450 to 11, uh, 14. Uh, and so we, we have a, about a hundred year difference in that. 
And of course, we struggle with that in biblical chronological order and trying to figure out times and places. And so, again, you know, as I said, you'll find different dates along the way. But here's one way, again, of breaking down uh, the book of Judges in a way that we can uh, study it and see some of the major events that take place uh, along the way. Uh, going back uh, to this particular area here, uh, we see that it is in the earlier part of the book of Judges that uh, Naomi and her husband and her family uh, go into Moab uh, and we find the book of Ruth. And so the book of Ruth takes place really uh, not that far into uh, the chronological dating of the book of Judges. This is the statement of our text today, and, and it's something we need to, to think about. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnah, Heres, and Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill, Gaush. And also all the generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there rose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works that he had done for Israel. This is a, a very sad uh, scripture. Joshua, Moses, the great leaders of Israel had taught the people the law, given it to the Levites. The high priest was responsible for the law. Uh, and sadly, when Joshua dies, and all of those of that generation who knew Joshua and knew of the great things that happened, the events, uh, they were in essence gathered to their fathers. They died. And we're told that there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. I have said and heard it said for many years, and it's something that we need to understand as a church. No matter what we accomplish today, just like what Joshua accomplished in his day, we are but one generation away from apostasy and no one understanding the true nature of the church which Jesus established. And I hope and, and uh, you know that we can do something to bring and raise up a generation after us who will follow the things of God. But we're constantly seeing those who become bored with the things of God, the teachings of the scriptures, trying to add new things to the worship and the service of God. And that next generation, if they do not have a respect of the scriptures and the things of God as delivered to them, it really doesn't matter what we do in this generation. If we can't get the next to continue that, uh, we're going to be in trouble. And Israel was in trouble time and time and time again here in the book of Judges. And it will continue in Samuel and, and the kings as the children of Israel ebb and flow, follow and disrespect the things of God. When we get into the book of Kings and we start talking about the kings of Israel when they establish that, We'll find that there were good kings and that there were bad kings. Uh, and some led the people of Israel into the truth of God, and some uh, had no respect for God whatsoever. And so uh, we need to put a great deal of emphasis on 
uh, making sure that the next generation following us knows the things of God, that we're training young men and young women to lead their families into being faithful with God, and especially the young men to be preachers and Bible teachers and give the church the things of God it needs, the teachings of God to be successful along the way. In continuing, it says that once this generation that knew not God began to follow after other things, other people, picking up the idols and uh, interested in new things, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal, who was a Phoenician deity originally, but uh, while this word is plural, it's talking about deities, sometimes uh, the word Lord is substituted for Baal, B-A-A-L, in the scriptures. And these are the lords of the other nations. These are the gods, <coughs> excuse me, of the other nations. And so they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the people that were round about them, bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth, which is a, another pagan deity there uh, in uh, the Canaanite lands. We need to make sure, and I keep emphasizing this, but it is the great purpose of the church to make sure that the church is not forsaking the teachings of the word of God, that the church is being faithful to the worship and the service and the lifestyle that God has given us. And we're told here in verse 14, through these cycles, that uh, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers and spoiled them. That is, their enemies who came and caused them great suffering. He sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Those enemies that under Joshua and their faithfulness, they were able to drive away. They were not able to do so when they forsook the Lord and lost his blessings. And as a church and as the people today, we need to understand if we're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth, then uh, we are going as a church to fail. Uh, we have to be faithful to the things of God. And yes, as I would say, we have to hold our people accountable for the things that they do. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear to Thessalonians that you know, if people are not willing to abide in the doctrines that have been given to them, he also makes this clear to the Romans and others that we should not be including them in our fellowship. Because when we start bringing false teachers and false doctrine into the worship and the service of God, uh, we're going to have great difficulty. Here is a list, and I have included that uh, in, so you can take a look at it. It has the scriptural references to uh, the writings concerning the judges, and it also lists the number of years in which they served as a judge over the people of Israel. And you see Othniel, 40 years as a judge. That's a entire generation of people. Yehud, 80 years. That's two generations. Shamgar, which uh, we don't really know about the number of years. Deborah and Barak, 40 years, another generation. Gideon, 40 years. That's another generation. Uh, we have an asterisk here uh, with Abimelech, three years. Uh, he was, uh, you know, one who took over for a short period of time after Gideon, 
many times he is really not seen as a judge literally, but someone who ties the period between Gideon and Tola, 23 years shorter period of time uh, than Jair, uh, 22 years, Japheth, six years, Ibsen, seven, Allen, 10, uh, Abdon, eight, Samson, 20. Samson is another one of those heroes of faith that many times we speak of, but even Samson himself and uh, had failures in his life. And I would just, uh, you know, as we study the book of Judges, sadly, some of the things that we see is even though these judges uh, called the people back to God and led them to a time of peace, uh, sometimes we see these judges themselves fail in their service to God. And so uh, it is right for us to understand what Paul says in Romans, the third chapter, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even great leaders of God's people in this book and others fail. So uh, we have listed here, even though it's not in the book of Judges, and sometimes people don't think of it as so, but Eli, who was priest of God in Samuel, uh, took over and kind of tried to lead the children of Israel uh, for 40 years. And then Samuel comes along and he leads for about 12 years uh, until the people want a king. They want a king like all the other nations. And so Saul was made the first official king over the nation of Israel. So you can look at some of those verses and break that down. I hope it's useful to you and, and you can make use of that. I put another chart here and I'm not going to uh, go into detail, but it breaks down the judges and what tribe they came from, some significant events that took place during their time, the enemy of Israel that was used for the oppression the number of years, and how much rest, and some scriptural references. And so I brought this in here so that you can break that down. Uh, I do want to, to look at one thing down here on the bottom, Abimelech, that we spoke of earlier that I said tied Gideon. Uh, Abimelech was not really a judge, but he was the son of Gideon, and he took over after Gideon until... Uh, the next judge was appointed. The book of Judges ends with this statement, Judges 21, 25. In those days, that is the days of the judges, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Friends, this is the very heart of denominational Christianity. This is the very problem that Christ's church has to deal with. Every man cannot do what is right in his own eyes. We must follow the New Testament. We must follow the law of God. Now, I know it says here in those days there was no king in Israel. It's right and it's wrong at the same time. There was no physical king such as Saul and others in Israel. But the children of Israel forgot that God was their king. God did not intend for the children of Israel to have an earthly king which would lead them into trouble. But he wanted them to accept him as king and to do according to the law which was given them. And I repeat again to the church today, you know, we have a king, Jesus. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And we cannot do what is right in our own eyes. Jesus said in Matthew 28, in the closing part of the Great Commission, teach them, that is the church, the disciples, teach them to observe all things 
whatsoever I have commanded you. The church is not about what I think or you think, how I feel or you feel, what I believe will work or don't believe will work. The church is about listening to God, listening to what the Holy Spirit has given us in the Word of God and making application of that and not doing what's right in our own eyes, but doing right as God has given that to us in his scriptures. The Bible is and should always be the final authority in matters of faith and religion. In making some application of today's lesson, as we begin to wrap up, the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 1, Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Friends, Jesus is the greatest judge we're ever going to have. Jesus delivered us from the devil. He delivered us from the power of sin and death, uh, that we could be delivered and find peace and make peace with God. And to him, verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The church does not exist to bring glory to Brian Barrett. It doesn't exist to bring glory to any one person other than Jesus Christ and God our Father. And Paul could see a change taking place in the church there at Galatia when he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. This is exactly the same thing that happened with the children of Israel. While Paul was at Galatia preaching and teaching the word of God, the people were faithful to his teachings. But once he left and went on to other works, some other people began to teach things uh, they, they began to fall into sin, sinful ways, uh, doing the things that they wanted. And in essence, as Paul said, they created another gospel, which is not another gospel, but what they did is much like the Old Testament. They created uh, not a literal, but a figurative idol. They were worshiping in a way which God had not authorized. And so, the Apostle Paul uh, had to come back and deliver them or try to deliver them from the air of their ways so that they could be able to serve the living God. Because as he continues, and I'm not going to read it all, but to preach another gospel, whether it comes from an angel or from man, is to bring us into an accursed situation. When Paul was writing the church of Corinth, another example that did the things that they were supposed to be doing until they were left to be faithful to God and they began to sin. He reminds them, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When Paul came to Corinth, the Corinthians we're in that first state of sin and adultery. And the gospel was preached to them, and they repented, and they entered into a time of peace. And if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Paul tells them that in 2 Corinthians 5. Old things have passed away because uh, all things have become new. 
but it seems that they were going back to their old ways. And Paul reminds them that they can't do that. You cannot go back to your old ways. You have to follow God because the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Jude reminds us in Jude 1 and following, saying, uh, especially in verse 3, Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you, of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It doesn't get any plainer than this. When Jude was writing the church, he told them, we have to contend for the faith. That is a definite statement. There is the faith. That is the faith of Jesus Christ, the faith that is taught today through the New Testament. And as we look at this particular scripture and think about it, uh, he tells us that the faith, that is the New Testament faith was once delivered unto the saints. This word once means once and for all, not once upon a time, such as one time this was said, but it was given once and for all unto the saints. The New Testament is not updated. It does not need updates. There doesn't need to be a new New Testament. There doesn't need to be a new gospel or another gospel. We just need to take care of the gospel which God has given us. And he warns us that there are certain men crept in unawares. And he says, before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he warns us about the children of Israel taking them out of the land of Egypt and uh, destroying them, talking about this cycle of sin. And Jude is warning them that even in the church, uh, there is this process where men come in unaware carrying with them their own beliefs, what they feel is right, what they think is right, and they try to lead other men and women in the church to follow their evil ways. And if we're not careful, the church would go back into apostasy. Peter says in Second Peter, uh, second chapter, verse one, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you who privately or privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And they'll bring that upon us too, to the price of our eternal soul, if we don't learn to break this cycle of sin and abuse and learn to be faithful and live according to the word of God. Paul warns the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters saith the Lord. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Make sure that our greatest fellowship is with Jesus Christ and his word and with those who dearly trust and believe that and do not let others lead us into the mistakes 
that has been accomplished by others. And our lesson today is God provides deliverers and he has provided the greatest deliverer all in Jesus Christ. He has given us this one who judges over us today through the pages of the New Testament, showing us what is right and what is wrong. And one day we'll have to answer for how we have lived and how we have either been faithful or unfaithful to the things which have been taught. We're going to uh, bring our, our lesson to a close here and we're gonna open it up to questions in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to go back to God in prayer if you bow with me. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace. We're so thankful, Father, that you have given us Jesus to be our King, to be a judge over us, to lead us into all truth and to righteousness. Teach us, Father, to follow your word. Teach us to be faithful to the things which you've taught us. Keep us from those sins and the disappointments that others have done that we not fail in our service to you. Help us, Father, to be able to take the things we know and to teach them to others that may be able still to teach them even further that the church not just be faithful in this generation, but that the church continues to be faithful until Jesus comes again. Be with our sick, afflicted, our hurting, the hungry. Be with the war-torn areas, Father. Bless them all. Give to us a measure of your grace sufficient unto our need. For all of these things, we do ask and pray in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. So any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Brother Brent Barrett, for your wonderful teaching. Uh, really, it's a wonderful time that... Uh, uh, we spent a uh, lot of things where we learned from the Job Book of Jude. Uh, thank you so much for your teaching. It is a time of asking the questions. Uh, now it is a time for asking questions. If you have any question, you can ask with Brian Barrett. Uh, hello, brother. Brian. Abel Arjun, you have any question? No, I have no question, but I learned something uh, new from the Preacher Brian Barrett. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much for the wonderful teaching. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, is it posting? Uh, how is Jesus our King of Kings and Lord of Lord? And uh, according to the Matthew 2, verse 2 says, Jesus Christ was the King of Jude. Uh, he came as the King of the Jews. The gospel okay. goes to the Jew first and also. Uh, to the Greek, Paul says, the gospel first was preached to the Jews. Jesus came to lead his people, the Jewish people, into the truth. But now in the church, Jesus is king over all. Jesus says in Matthew 28, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so Jesus is the King of King and Lord of Lords over all because the gospel is to go into all the world. The church is to go into all the world and people are supposed to be keeping and obeying all of the things that were taught by the apostles as revealed in the New Testament. And so uh, Jesus reigns in our life if we follow the things of the New Testament. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time and study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. 
If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.